in the verse when I was drifting out in sin. I had no peace, no joy within, but Jesus came and made me glad. The dearest friend I ever had, he saved my soul. Many of you are glad that we got the dearest friend you've ever had. I'm glad he's the best thing that's ever happened to me, friend. Hey, there's been many friends in this life. They've came and gone. Hey, but the Lord, he's always sure. He's steadfast. He's the friend that's seeking closer than a brother. He's a wonderful God, friend. And I'm glad he's the dearest friend. Let's sing that last verse again. Bring him here, Richard. Oh, sinner, come to Jesus now. At his feet, just humbly bow. He'll save your soul and make you glad. The dearest friend I ever had. He saved my soul. Oh, bless his name. Let's turn over to page number three. Let's sing the love of God. Page number three. Amen. Amen. Already on that verse. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest of to the lowest hell, the guilty pair by that. 
seated. You can be seated. Thank you for being here. I thank you for your faithfulness. I appreciate God allowing us to gather back together again tonight for revival. And we pr we praise the Lord for what the Lord's done thus far. Amen, church. I appreciate Brother Paul Shirley and uh, preaching to us and uh, taking his Bible and giving to us the Word of God. Well, I'm thankful for God's Word. Amen. I'm thankful for how it uh, changes our lives. And we've been challenged and we've been helped. Uh, I hope that uh, those of you that heard the message on uh, on Wednesday, I hope that you're still uh, taking that, taking heed to that. How that a wounded spirit can hinder you in such a manner. We don't want that. Amen. And as a church, it can hinder so many things. And then last night, being preached to about our faith, how that our faith ought to have uh, some legs to it, amen. It ought to have some arms to it. It ought to uh, put us to action if we truly are believing. And, uh, boy, that's exactly what we're doing in heaven. And we're looking forward to Brother Tom Hadley uh, preaching for us tonight. And, uh, uh, he's come a good piece, and Kevin's come with him. Uh, but he's made it. He, he thought church started at 7. Thank the Lord he came here early, amen. And uh, had plenty of time to get ready. And so we're looking forward to him preaching. Amen, church. And uh, looking forward to that. We're going to have some good singing. Uh, but before we do, uh, I'd like to get started with an offer of prayer together. Again, before we move and come, uh, remember those that can't be here. We've got a handful still out sick. I mentioned little Eva. Uh, also, Miss Debbie. I tried to mention her yesterday. So she's been dealing with sickness. Um, and some others that would be here. But dealing with sickness, it's that time of year, you know. And then, uh, so let's pray about that. And remember our church. Remember the service. Pray for Brother Paul, or uh, Brother Tom, excuse me. And, uh, and ask the Lord if there's anything in our hearts tonight that would hinder what he has in store. Let's get, let's do business with God and make that thing. Everybody that can and will, let's gather in around the altar. Brother Paul will play softly for us as you come. And uh, if you decide to remain in your pew, that's fine. But help us pray, and uh, let's take some time and just spend some time together uh, in one mind and one accord, and let's just talk to God on behalf of this service. Be a blessing if there be somebody in our midst that's not saved. It'd be a blessing if they got saved tonight, if they're lost. And so let's remember and ask the Lord to do that. Uh, if somebody be here and lost, let's pray that God save them. Maybe somebody's here that's hurting. Maybe they've heard some news since yesterday. Whatever the need might be, let's just take our time and pray on behalf of one another. And don't forget to give the Lord thanks. He's worthy of our praise. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. God, thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person that's made a point, Lord, to be here tonight. And God, we pray, uh, Lord, that your presence have free reign in this place. Lord, I pray. Uh, God, that you would stir and move, and Lord, that you'd manifest yourself in whatever shape or form you see fit, God. Lord, I pray desperately, Lord, that there be any of our midst, Lord, that's not been saved, God. I pray you'd convict them. Lord, I pray that you'd draw them. Give them the courage, God, to come forward and be converted tonight. Lord, if we got in our midst, Lord, that's going through the storm or going through struggles, God, got things going on, they just don't know what to do in their suffering. God, I pray that they get the help, Lord, and uh, that they stand in need of, Lord. But whatever your will might be in regards to those that are here, I pray, God, you'd intervene and help. Lord, be with those that wish they could, but due to sickness and other things, God, I pray you'd help them, uh, Lord, to recover. Lord, I pray for everybody that tunes in on the live stream, God, that uh, maybe you'd give them the touch that they stand in need of, Lord. And be with Brother Tom as he stands. We pray that he'd have unction and anointing, God. I pray to have liberty in this place. to be no re restraint in him, God, as he stands and preaches the word of God. Lord, I pray for the songs that sung. And Lord, for each and every person that's here, God, that your will be done. And Lord, that God's people leave with loving you more. We love you tonight, God. We pray you touch us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's have the choir come up and sing a little bit tonight. Amen.
Thank you. 
trusted this evening, aren't you? I'm glad that no matter what I'm going through in this life, no matter what's going on in my in my sad existence of trying to serve him, that he cares about me, amen. I don't deserve it tonight. We don't deserve what he's done for us. We don't deserve that the God of heaven, the one that spoke everything new into existence, Brother Josh, cares about what you have to think. He cares about what you care about. I'm glad he cares about us tonight. Would there be somebody with a word on your heart? Something you want to say or do at this time? Anything at all? When Elijah breaks out, he goes, Well, Tom, that's my wife, and she's in the middle. And we'll just be doing random things around the house. And then he starts singing, Jesus loves me. I didn't tell him to do that. You raise your hand while you're singing if you think you didn't do that. I was raised in a Christian home. Raising a preacher's home, I don't deserve that. But you ought to just see some of the things that I've seen in the church and I can know all the family. I'm glad the Lord put you where He put you in the home that I grew up in. And that's not to make light of anybody that didn't get the arrangement I had. I'm just thankful for what He's done for me. Be somebody else and roll on your heart this way. Anything at all. Amen. Be somebody else with a word on your heart. Our hearts free. Season by season, I watch. 
watch him amazed in all the mystery of his perfect ways. All I have need of his hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. I can't remember a trial or a pain. He did not recycle to bring me gain. And I can't remember one single regret in serving God only and trusting His hand. All I have need of, His hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me this is my anthem and this is my song the theme of the stories I've heard for so long that God has been faithful he will His loving compassion, it knows no end. All I have need of, His hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. can't remember a trial or a pain he did not recycle to bring me gain and I can't remember one single regret in serving God only and trusting his hand. All I have need of, his hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. This is my stories I've heard for so long. God has been faithful. He will be again. His loving compassion, it knows no to me.
Amen. I'm glad he's faithful. Even when I'm not faithful. I say even especially when I'm not faithful. I'm glad he's better than me. Better than you. And even when life is tough and things look hard and things look bleak, we're just, we're just going to have to trust. We're going to have to trust he knows what's best. Because on the other side of it, you know, you'll find out he did. He knew what was best. Amen. I'm glad he's faithful. If I'm being honest, I'm tired from this journey. If I'm being honest, I've wanted to give up. The battle's getting stronger, can't hold on much longer. If I'm being honest, I've had enough. But thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me, the glory and the lifter of my head. You heard my cry, you saved my life, so I will give to you my every breath. If I'm being honest, I don't deserve you. If I'm being honest, my soul should be in hell. But you'll never forsake me, no matter what breaks me. If I'm being honest, you have never failed for that. shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. You heard my cry, you saved my life, so I will give to you my every breath. Truth is I'm not worthy of your love and mercy. But you keep on pouring out your blessings. Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. You've heard my cry, you saved my life. So I will give to you my every breath if I'm being honest. If I'm being honest. There's only been one sinless man to walk this path I know. And there's only been one king whose blood could wash me white as snow. Yet by his holy grace, he bore the cross and took my place so that a sinful, wicked murderer could live. In spite of this perfect gift from the Father's only Son, every day I fail to bear His name for all the wicked things I've done. And although I'm sinful man, I know I'm in the Father's plan. And with mercy in His eyes, I see the love that stays His hand. If I got what I deserved, if I stood in my own place, then surely God could see this guilt upon my face. Yet the Son of God 
gave me his blood so that anyone could see I didn't get what I deserve. Instead, he died for you and me. Oftentimes in life, I found myself down on my knees, searching for a way to earn forgiveness from my king. And yet every time I pray, I can hear the master say that in spite of my sin, he has unlimited grace. If I got what I deserve, if I stood in my own place, then surely God could see this guilt upon my face yet the son of god gave us his blood so that anyone could see i didn't get what i deserved instead he died for you and me though he knows that we will fail him took my sin and pain upon him now i can't help but adore him because he first loved me if we got what we deserve if we stood in our own place then surely god could see this guilt upon our face yet the sun God gave us his blood and now anyone can see we didn't get what we deserve instead he died for you and me we didn't get what we deserve instead he died for you and me Here's Brother Tom Hatley, and he has been a friend to your preacher, uh, in spite of your preacher. Amen. I, uh, I dropped in on, on a, a Sunday morning service at Fellowship Baptist Church uh, back in the old building, the one before this one. I don't know. How many buildings have you, have you had now? Do you know off the top of your head? We've had one, two, three, four buildings. Four buildings. And uh, I'm only 27 years He's old. <laughs> That's why I look this way. Amen. Amen. And uh, as you all know, Heather and I were dealing with some infertility. We were going to Knoxville to see a doctor about it. And we stopped in at Fellowship Baptist Church. And uh, and I walked in the back and sat in the back and just was there to blend in. That six foot seven. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Brother Tom come was on me like a hound dog. Come back there, want to know who it was, what we were, you know, what we were doing. And uh, he ended up asking me to come back and preach that night. And this church was so good to me. They gave me a love offering. They paid for the treatment that me and Heather had. And I had no idea. He didn't even know why we was there. We didn't tell him why we were there. Uh, he's just been a friend to us ever since. And we go to their winter team camp meeting. Looking forward to going there this year. In case y'all was wondering where Brother Jeff is, uh, I think he's been going. They're going back, but uh, I'm glad he's here. Amen, Sherry. And he started pastoring. How old was he? 24. 24. That's how old I was. So Three we're, years ago. We're we're kindred spirits, even though we're so different to look at, right? But uh, y'all love him. Y'all get your Bibles. He'll be a blessing to you. Looking forward to it. Well, it is a blessing to be here. I'm glad to be at the Grace Independent Baptist Church. And the place looks a lot different than the last time I was here. And it looks different. And uh, I told your preacher it even smells new. And uh, that's a blessing. We thank the Lord for it. I appreciate Brother Caleb asking me to come. And uh, I've enjoyed the good singing tonight. Good 
congregational singing and the choir and the special singing. And that's a real blessing to me. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate you preaching. And he is a friend. I thank the Lord. God didn't know all about or I, We didn't know all about that, or I didn't know all about that, but God did. And uh, I'm glad that the Lord uh, used that first opportunity of meeting uh, to spark a friendship there. And uh, I praise God for that. And uh, that winter meeting he mentioned, I'd love for you to come. And uh, you'd be more than welcome. We'd, we'd make you feel at home. And, uh, and I hope to see some of you maybe come in, in, in the end of December. And uh, uh, go ahead and take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, I've got these, they call them readers. Now, I had eye surgery, and they messed up one eye. Yeah, this left eye, I can't see all that, I don't hardly. And uh, the right eye is good, so I don't have to wear glasses all the time. I had astigmatism. And and this right eye, man, I can see like 20, 30. So it's really good. I mean, I wore glasses when I was five years old. But i got to wear these things because I can't see close up. Now, here's my problem. I can't see with them, and I can't see without them. So you pray for me as I try to read and, and, and try to preach here a little bit. And uh, God's been good to us. I, I, I appreciate the, the sister's testimony back there. I like what she said. She said, all I wanted was to be saved from hell, but God gave me so much more. And boy, that's the truth for all of us. And uh, my, my granddaddy on my, on my daddy's side, I never met him. He was a, he was a, a convicted rapist uh, put in prison when my daddy was just a little boy. And my daddy only has one little faint memory of him. I had only one faint memory. And then his stepdaddy was, was a drunkard. He's raised rough. His mama was saved. My mimi is what I called her. And on my daddy's side, or I'm sorry, on my mama's side, my her daddy was also a drunkard, but God saved him. And uh, my mama was raised in church. She got saved as a teenager. Uh, she never followed Lord in baptism. She got saved late in her teenage years, never got baptized, and uh, married my daddy, who was an unbeliever. And my daddy was a, a good man, a moral man. I mean, every, everybody, I mean, you know, you couldn't say a whole lot negative about him as far as the world was concerned, but he was going to hell. And uh, in his mid-40s, he got saved by the grace of God. And I got saved about six weeks later. And I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised in church. I was a teenage boy by the time I got saved. My brother had already moved out of the house by the time my daddy got saved. But you know, I'm thankful for what God did in my daddy's life. He's in heaven right now. And I'm thankful for what the Lord's done in my life. And we all have our struggles, Brother Paul. But God's faithful to us. I'm so glad <laughs> that he's faithful to us. And I wasn't raised in church, and I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But I'm thankful that my children have been raised in church and been raised in a Christian home. And I tell you, we we hear around our type of people, and I'm not I'm not against it, Brother Caleb. I'm for it. You hear a lot about you know our heritage, and if you got a good heritage, you ought to be thankful for a good heritage. But some of us we don't have that type of heritage. But we sure enough can start one. Amen. There's a lot of folks in my church. They they don't know they don't know anything about they didn't know anything about old time religion, but they got saved and they raised their babies up and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And what a blessing it is uh, to see people saved and, uh, and to see God change the lives of the people and uh, to change families. And I mean, I mean, the whole outcome of families get changed when God moves in. I mean, it's really something to behold. And I, and, you know, I think about them young ones lifting their hand. Isn't that something? Oh, praise God. And I tell you what else tickles me sometimes. Somebody gets saved about 40, 50 years old and, don't know anything about church. Man, when I got saved, I didn't even know how to read a song book. That's the truth. It didn't make sense to me. I mean, you got that one, two, three, and you got to drop down. I'm thinking you ought to sing up here before you sing down here. I, none of that made sense to me. I mean, I couldn't tell. I couldn't have quoted John 3, 16. I didn't know nothing about it. 
And in the church I got saved in, we, we'd sing, we'd sing, uh, we, we'd sing the first two verses, skip the third, and sing the fourth. You ever been in churches like that? And skip that third verse. We always skip the third verse. And about about six months in, I looked over to the fellow that was singing beside me, another teenage boy, and I said, "Well, why do we skip that third verse?" And he looked at me and he said, "Cause that's a Church of God verse." Now he's pulling my leg. But I was probably pastor for about three or four years before I realized, hey, that the third verse wasn't a church of God. Well, then come to find out the whole book was church of God, amen. Hey, I, I, I didn't know nothing. But I see some of them, some of them people get saved about, about 35 years old, 40 years old, you know, 50 years old. They get saved. And just like them little babies lifting their hands, uh, you know, they'll get up there and they start singing in the choir. And, boy, they're so stiff, you know. But then one, one service, maybe God will move by. And I'll, you'll see that little hand come up. And I get so tickled when I see a 50-year-old do it just as much as I get tickled when I see a two-year-old do it. I mean, it just blesses my heart. Amen. Amen. Y'all ought to try it one time. I mean, mo most people ain't looking at you anyway. I mean, I, I mean, if you're worried about it, sit in the back. And everybody put everybody in front of you. And then when, when God touches you, all just lift that hand up again. I, I mean, that, that'll bless you. You ought to say Amen. I remember, I remember the first time I said amen. I was in church, and the preacher was preaching. Can I just talk just a second? And, and, and the preacher was preaching, and I thought he was preaching pretty good. I was probably 19, 20 years old. I got saved when I was 15. And I was listening to him preach, and, I, and it was a Sunday morning. And he was, I mean, the crowd was low, and it had a, had a big cell in it, and, and the echo, you know. And, and he was just dead on a hammer. Now, he wasn't dead. He's preaching hard. But everybody else is dead. And I thought to myself, I was sitting up, up towards the front, and I thought to myself, now them deacons ought to be saying amen right now. And I, I went to church, and women didn't say amen in the church I got saved in. Nobody said amen except for them deacons. Them deacons would say amen. And, and the deacons wasn't saying amen. And boy, it bothered me. And I thought, them deacons ought to be saying amen right now. And God, and I didn't hear him say it, but I felt it in my heart and my mind. that God said, won't you say amen? And I said, well, I can't do that. I'm not a deacon. And he said, no, you don't have to be a deacon. And I said, well, I'm just a kid. He said, well, God said, you ought to say amen anyway. And I was sitting there, and he's just preaching just so hard. And I said, amen. I looked to my left, looked to my right. Nobody seemed to notice, you know. He preached a little longer. I said, amen. Nobody said nothing to me about it. Nobody even looked funny at me. By the third time around, I said, Amen. This time I knew they were going to say something. I looked around, everybody said, Fine. Everybody just kept on looking. And then finally, in that big ceiling in, it, in that room, I said, Amen. That thing echoed, 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 echoed. And I thought, Boy, I've really done it now. But you know, I've been saying Amen ever since. Hey, amen. What, what, what about this good Bible word? Hallelujah. That's a good. Amen. Some parts of the country you might say hallelujah. Amen. You say hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. This is what I say this. I say that's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Speak to your preacher. Sometimes it'll help him. I bet that preacher that day, them deacons, they'd probably be mad at him or something. I don't know why they wouldn't say that, amen. But I bet, I bet, he never said a word to me about it. But looking back as a pastor, I, I, I bet, I bet he thought, man, that 19 year old boy's helping me. Amen. You'd be amazed. And then you know what? There's a fellow sitting beside me, two, three services after I started saying amen. He, he's a pastor of an independent Baptist church now, too. He looked at me. He said, I'm going to try it. That's what he said. He said, I'm going to try it. He's about 18 years old. He said, Amen. He started out low and prayed. Now he's the biggest mouth preacher I know. You know. But it's good to say amen. It's good to worship God. I'm thankful for children that, that learn to worship God, and I'm thankful for adults that learn to worship God. And uh, we ought to worship God. The Bible said that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You know, Brother, Brother Caleb, there's a, there's a good study, if you, if you ever want to look at it, in, in the Gospel of John, there's divine declarities. There's several times where the word must is used. Jesus said in John chapter 3, ye must be born again. Amen. John chapter 4, ye must worship God 
in spirit and in truth. I, th- I think he said, I must needs go through Samaria. There, 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 there's a lot, there, there's more. There's more in a divine declarative. But if we're going to worship God, we got to worship in spirit and in truth. You say, amen, amen. That fellow back there, raise your hand. We got the Pentecostal parent in the, in the, in the <laughs> I ain't never seen anybody like you. <laughs> Amen. I guarantee you. <laughs> ah, man. I pan- handing out the watchtower and speaking in tongues at the same time. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Amen. And now he's in a Baptist church. What about that? Well, if we'd witness like him, Jehovah Witnesses, we'd be doing a good job, wouldn't we? Amen. Praise God. We'd worship. Well, I ain't going to say that all the way, but but if we, we'd get a little vocal like in Pentecostals, you know. That might help us some too. Amen. Well, we're, what did I say? First Thessalonians? That's what I meant to say. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. This, this, this is a, um, I tell you what, let's go ahead and begin reading at verse 7, and we'll read down through verse 10. This might be a, um, an unusual type message for revival. But I believe it's what God would have us to preach. It's not what I brought to preach, but I believe it's what God would have us to preach. And I want you to look here at verse 7 to begin with. And, and the Bible says here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. We'll read down through verse 10, and we'll focus on verse 8. But in verse 7, the Bible says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth, her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we're willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and our travail, for laboring at night and day, because we would not be chargeable un- un- unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also how holily and justly and unblamably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight, God, as we bow before you, Lord, we come with a thankful heart. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and God for the privilege, uh, God, to be in this church, and God for the opportunity and privilege we've got to assemble ourselves together here tonight. Thank you, God, that we come to you in prayer, that we can boldly come for thy throne of grace and obtain mercy, God, in a time of need. Lord, I need you tonight, and I pray that you help me. I pray that you strengthen me. God, I pray that you'll forgive me, God, where I've sinned and, God, where I've come short. I pray that, that I'll be right with you, and, God, that you'll use me tonight as an instrument of righteousness to communicate thy word unto these people. I pray that you give me liberty. I pray that you give me power. I pray that you give me unction to preach thy word. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. God, thank you that he died for our sins, and God, that he was buried, and Lord, that that, that he rose from the dead. God, for on that appointed day that we could be justified in your sight. Lord, I pray that you help us now, and God, deal with hearts how you see fit, and God, just recall things to our remembrance. Give us, God, what we need to say Hold back anything we need not to say. And dear God, I pray that I say everything that is pleasing to you and everything that will be profitable to these people. And God will praise and will thank you for it's in Jesus Christ's name we ask it for his sake. Amen. Yeah, my water disappeared. What did I do with it? Did you drink it? I mean, it really got raptured. Did somebody, did somebody sneak up here and get it? What happened to it? Well, I don't know what happened. It fell or something. I need to. Praise the Lord. The Lord always provides. Now, you help me tonight. I, 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 I mean, when I say that, I want you to pray for me. I'm nervous. I'm not usually nervous. I'm anxious. I'm not usually anxious. But I am just a little bit tonight. And, I, and I'm not real comfortable right now for some reason. I don't know. That, that's got nothing to do with you, Brother Caleb. That's got nothing to do with the church. That might be some kind of opposition from the devil. I don't know what it is. But I, but I ask you to pray for me. And I want to preach tonight something that will help you, uh, something that will help this church. And that word revival, that means something. 
And that's a very specific term that your pastor has used there. Fall revival. So as we look at the passage tonight, I, I want you to keep that word in mind. And you look at the scripture that we've just read, and we don't really see a revival passage. But I, I want to point out something to you here. There's several things that I could point out to you. Here in, in this particular epistle in chapter 1, we see that, that Paul writes and he speaks about a model church. The Bible talks about the, the church of the Thessalonians. And there's several characteristics of this church that we find in chapter 1 that make it a, an example. The Bible even uses the word example here in chapter 1 in relation to the church. And God help us to be a model church. God help the Fellowship Baptist Church in Maryville, Tennessee to be a model church. God help the Grace Independent Baptist Church in Russell Springs, Kentucky to be a model church. God help us to have some of the characteristics that this church had and this church uh, uh, that Paul expressed and showed here in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Paul writes uh, of a model church. In chapter 2, he writes of a model servant, or we could say a model ministry. And let me say tonight that you may uh, not be called to preach, you may not be called to be a pastor, a missionary, an evangelist, but you are called to be a servant. And as we think about revival, let me say this, that we ought to have a revival of service. Hey, you may not be called to pastor, you may not be called to preach, hey, but you are called to the ministry. Every one of us are called to serve, every one of us are called uh, to minister uh, unto other people. And the Bible gives us uh, an outline here, it gives us an example uh, uh, of a model servant or a model ministry. Now, ministry by definition, let me say this, ministry by definition is about people. Is that not right? right. Now, you've heard it said, and we, we say it, and, and we laugh at it, and it, it's a joke, and we think it's funny because it is funny. But people say, well, you know, and preachers say it because they deal with people. And, and, and have you ever dealt with people? I bet you have. Amen. You, you might work in a, in, a, in a clothing store. You may work in a bank. You may work in a factory or an office or a schoolhouse or a hospital. Wherever you work at, you're probably going to have to deal with some people. And, and they say about the ministry, they say the ministry would be all right if it wasn't for people. And we smile and we laugh and we say, boy, ain't that the truth. Amen. Hey, but we know that there'd be no ministry without people. And ministry is about people. I mean, the very definition of it is about people. Now, uh, a casual reading of this passage of Scripture, this chapter, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we would see right here that there was a very special bond between Paul and his beloved converts. Now, we're going to look at some of these verses again that we read, but, but I, mean, I want you to just notice some of the language uh, that we read there in verse 7. Look at it again. I'm not going to read it. I just want you to look at it. Some of the language, some of the words that are used there in verse 8 and then down in verse 9 uh, and on down to, to verse 10. Uh, uh, now, uh, in verse 8, I believe here, is, is the key uh, verse of this particular chapter. I want you to look at it again. The Bible said, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. Now let me say this. It is possible to win someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is possible to impart to them the gospel of God, the gospel of the grace of God, and not impart unto them your soul. Now you say, well, how do you know that, preacher? Well, because I've done it. And if you've served God for any amount of time, and you've uh, been a witness to people, and you've uh, perhaps God has used you as an instrument to, to lead someone to, to, to the Lord, uh, then, then there's probably times that you've imparted to them the gospel, but that you did not impart uh, to them uh, your, your soul. And God help us. Uh, if we're going to be successful in the ministry, we must impart to them the gospel of God, but we must also impart to them our own soul. He uses the language here. He said, not the gospel of God only. Uh, imparting the gospel is very uh, important. Obviously, we know that. We understand that. Uh, and, and of course, when we don't impart our own soul, I said, I said, I know that uh, 
I, I, I know that I, I've that you can impart the gospel without imparting your own soul because I've done it, and and in doing so, I've hindered the gospel. What what I'm what I want to say to you tonight, and you keep praying for me because I I'm, I'm trying to get started here tonight, is that, that that what happens is when we don't impart our own soul. When we are not uh, uh, having the attitude in which the Apostle Paul had, where he said, Not only did I impart to you the gospel of God only, but my own soul I impart in you. When we don't follow the example, when we don't follow after the model servant, when we don't follow after the model minister, what we're doing, we're hindering discipleship. Now, talk about revival. We need a revival of discipleship. Amen. We, we need a revival uh, of service uh, uh, unto God. Now, there, there's, I believe there's four things, and I'm not going to preach on but there's four ways, four ways that you can invest in people. And that's what I'm talking about tonight. That's what I want to preach on tonight. I want to preach uh, about investing in people. And there's four ways that we find here in these verses that we read that we can invest in people. And I'm going to give you these, uh, I'm going to give you three of them just by the way of introduction. And then the fourth one is what we're going to try to focus on tonight uh, with God's help out of verse 8. Now the first thing I want you to notice there uh, in uh, uh, verse 9, I guess it is, it says, it says for, for we remember, brethren, our, our labor and travail, laboring night and day because you would not be chargeable unto, uh, to any of you and notice it says this. It said, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Isn't that so important? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Being born again, hey, uh, hey, of, of incorruptible seed. Hey, thank God for the gospel that's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Amen. Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort uh, with all long suffering and doctrine. Hey, listen, I'm talking about preaching the word. What I, what I want you to notice here, if you want to invest yourself uh, into others, then there must be evangelism. Now listen, we're just, we're just giving you an introduction here, remember? There ought to be a revival of evangelism. Now I believe this. I believe you can have evangelism without, without, without revival. I've seen it take place, haven't you? But I don't believe that you can have revival without evangelism. I'm talking about evangelism following revival. I mean, you get a bunch of people revived, they're going to preach the gospel. You get a bunch of people revived, they're going to impart to souls, hey, the gospel of God. They're going to impart the gospel of the grace of God when they get revived. Sure, sure enough, we need a revival of evangelism. And we see that right here in the Word of God, that, that, that if we want to invest in people, we need to invest through evangelism. Did I see some gospel tracts back there? That's investing through evangelism. Amen. Hey, uh, I saw a missionary board back there. That's investing through evangelism. Y'all listening? I believe we ought to preach to people across the streets, and I believe we ought to preach to people across the seas. Somebody say Amen. Oh, yeah. Hey, we need a revival of, of evangelism. We need to invest uh, people in people through evangelism. And then in verse 10, uh, if you look there, you can see that we ought to invest through example. In verse 10, the Bible says, You are our witnesses. And, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. The Bible talks about Paul. Is it in Second Corinthians where it talks about that, that we are a, 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 a written epistle? Now, I don't believe in what you call, what people call, you know, they, they talk about lifestyle evangelism. And, and, and what, what they mean by that is, well, I'm not going to tell anybody about Jesus, but I'm going to try to live right, and then somebody's going to see that, and they're going to see the light, and then, then they're going to come be saved. Well, I just don't know about all that. You know, I, I've, never, I, I've never had anybody come up to me and say, you know what? You remind me so much of Jesus, will you tell me how to be saved? I've never had that take place. Now, I did, Brother, brother Caleb. I had a fellow one time, and, 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 and I was getting off the, 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 uh, the, the elevator at Baltimore Hospital about 10.30 at night, 11 o'clock at night. It, it was late, and there wasn't anybody in the hospital lobby. And I stepped off that elevator, and there was a fellow like right, right about right here where you was. He was standing. And I looked at him. We kind of made eye contact. And I started walking. I started going in this direction, and, and I was leaving. And I just have something funny about the fellow, you know, something peculiar. 
choir, you know. Mountain people say that up in Kentucky, they say choir. Anybody know what that means, choir? Peculiar, yeah, amen. That's what my grandma always says, some, some weird fellow, he's, he's kind of choir, you know. But I thought this fellow kind of choir. And I look back at him, he's looking at me, and he kind of bends down like this. He says, he said, I perceive that thou art the man of God. And I said, yeah, I'm a preacher. I mean, he gave me the willies. I, I'm talking about the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I didn't know what was going on. Amen. I got out of there as quick as I could. Uh, but, but I've never had somebody say, boy, you, boy, that haircut reminds me so much of Jesus. That's a good looking tie. I like that color orange mixed in there. And will you tell me about Jesus? Hey, I don't believe in that lifestyle. Now I believe this though. You got you got to live right in front of people. You got to behave yourself. Is that not right? If you don't, if if you live like the devil, hey, they're not gonna listen to you. If you live like the world, the world's not gonna listen to you. Why do they need to listen to you? You're living just like they are. I worked with a fellow one time that we called him Possum. That was his nickname. And he was an older gentleman. When I say older, he was 40 and I was 20. You know, 40 is young, man, now, you know. Anybody under 53 is young now. Hey, well, let me say anybody under 55, amen. amen. That puts me as a young man, hallelujah. Hey, but, 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 but he, 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 was, he was a preacher, that's what he said. And he'd preach a little while. At night, we worked night shift. We worked third shift. He'd come in like 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I'd work until about 7. He'd come in, and, and, and he'd preach a little while, and then he'd cuss a little while. And that's the, way, that's the way he did it. Now, none of them fellows on, on, that, on that whole line, it was, he was me and another fellow as a Christian than this fellow I'm talking about. And he'd come in, he'd preach a little while, tell them how they, you know, how they need to get saved, how they need to repent, how they need to get right with God. Then next thing you know, he's over there cussing. Well, none of them fellows respected him. And I was walking out one morning, it was time for me to get off. He was still over in that frozen food section at the Kroger. That's where we were. And, and, and he looked at me, and he, he, said, he said, I need you to pray for me. And I said, well, I, well, I'll try. I said, I said, what's going on? He said, he said they're persecuting me here. And I, I, I thought about it, and I'm 20, he's 40. I didn't want to be disrespectful. But I said, I said, Doug, so these boys are not persecuting you. I said, I, I said, I said what they're doing, they're, they're mocking you because of your hypocrisy and because of your inconsistency. Amen. Hey. Listen, there's a, that, that, if, we're going to, if, we're, if we are going to be, uh, if we are going to invest in people, we've got to invest through evangelism, but we've also got to invest through example. And Paul, Paul invested in these Thessalonians through evangelism. He preached the gospel, and he did it through example, the way that he behaved himself, not only just in front of the lost people, but also in front of the believers. Amen. Too many of us, man, if we're not careful, we're going to be a stumbling block to a young Christian. But we see here in the Word of God, we see number one, uh, that we ought to invest through evangelism there in verse 9. Uh, number two, we're to invest through example in verse 10. Number three, also in verse 10, we're to invest through uh, encouragement. Listen, well, I guess that's in verse 11. Yeah, verse 11, the Bible says, And ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. God help us. Hey, we ought to exhort one another. That's why we come to church. That's what Hebrews 10, 25 says. Hey, we don't have to forsake the symptom of ourselves and matter of something, but, exo but, 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 but exhorting one another and so much more as we see that day approaching. Hey, the closer we get to Jesus is coming. Hey, we ought, to be, we ought to be meeting together. We ought to be exhorting one another. Hey, not just in a public worship service, but in our everyday life, we ought to be encouraging one another. We ought to be exhorting one another. And we invest in people through encouragement. Now, do you see all that right here in the Bible? Now, I preached the Bible right then. Yeah, that's what I like to preach. I don't like to preach nothing else. Somebody say amen. I've heard a lot of sermons that didn't come from the Bible. But I try to preach from the Bible. Amen. And we see that here in the Word of God. But now, back in verse 8, which is our, which is our, key, our key verse, the fourth way, this is our focus, the fourth way, and by the way, we, 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 need a, we, we do need a revival in, in, in being an example. 
And we do need a revival and exhortment and encouragement. But, but notice here in verse 8, we, we, we are to invest through empathy. Through empathy. I want to preach just for a little bit tonight. If God will help me, I won't, I won't preach too long. But I want to preach on, on revival of empathy. Now you can see here, for the benefit of my sermon, my outline, I use that word empathy. And, and we understand what that word means. We talk about Jesus being a sympathetic high priest. And he is. Amen. But he's also an empathetic high priest. The Bible said that he was tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. Say, hey, the Lord, he's not only sympathetic about what we go through, he's empathetic because he's went through it too. Amen. And we need that. We need that empathy. Now, uh, perhaps, Brother Caleb, a better word here, a, a more Bible word, a better Bible word would be compassion. The Bible talks about being moved with compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. Now, you can have sympathy for somebody and not have compassion for them. Amen. Hey, but if you've got real Bible, Holy Ghost compassion for somebody, then you're going to be moved with that compassion. Amen. I'm saying we need a revival uh, uh, of empathy. Look at our verse again. We'll read it one more time. The Bible says in verse 8, it says, So being affectionately desirous of you, that we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel only, but also our own souls because ye are dear to us. Now, it may sound kind of, we talked about that, we talked about the old saying, you know, uh, the ministry would be all right if it wasn't for people. And, th and this is not another one of them old sayings, and this might kind of sound trite to you, but, but I believe there's some truth in, in this, this saying that you hear people say. They, they say, the people won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I believe there's some truth in that, don't you? And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about compassion. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a, a, a revival of empathy. Now, there, there was a, a family, and I, I done told you, I, listen, I'm nothing. I mean, God help me. I, I mean, I'm a mess. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not even a good Christian. You listening? I mean, I try, I try but every day I fail God. And I'm, I'm pitiful, and, and I'm not trying to throw a bunch of false humility at you because I'm probably more prideful than I am humble. It's just the truth. You listening? So, I, so I'm not trying to lift myself up here. God help me. God knows my heart about it. Uh, and, and uh, but 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 I but I had years ago. I've been pastoring 29 years in December, so about 28 years ago, I was working at an automotive plant, and and and, and, uh, and about it's about 11 11 11 30 at night, maybe 12 o'clock at night. I had a fellow that I worked with called me, and I and we we worked together. We were not friends. I mean, we weren't enemies, but we we're not we were not close necessarily. But he knew I was a preacher. I just started pastoring. And he called me and, said, and, and he, 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 I answered the phone. He said, he said, is this Tom Hatley? And I said, it is. He said, this is Jeff Tucker. And he said, my mama has just died. And I said, Jeff, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, well, I, I appreciate it. He said, he said listen, I, I've got brothers. I've got sisters. I've got cousins. I've got nephews. I've got a daddy over here. And they're all tore up. They're distraught. He said, he said I... We don't, none of us are in church. We don't have a pastor. So we, we don't, we, we, we've already called the funeral home, but I, we just don't know what to do. And, 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 and Tom, if you, if you don't mind, would you come over here? I said, I, Jeff, I'll be there just as quick as I can. He gave me his address. I went over there, and sure enough, I, I went in. It, it was just a single wide trailer, and there were people sitting on the inside, people sitting on the outside, people lined up all around that trailer, cars in the yard, people smoking their cigarettes, people, you know, just, just weeping and crying and carrying on. Their grandmother had died. Their mama had died. Uh, uh, the, the daddy's wife had died. The, the aunt, uh, uh, so a bunch of them lived right there on the same street, and everybody had come over. The neighbors had come over. Just people everywhere. And I went in there, and, and, I, and I began to talk to Jeff. And Jeff began to introduce me to his brothers, and they introduced me to his sister, introduced me to his daddy, and introduced me to his nieces and uncles and, uh, and aunts and neighbors and so forth and so on. 
And I didn't say a whole lot. I, 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 you know, I introduced myself as he introduced me. And, and I, you know, I'd hold her hand and say, so I'm praying for you. God bless you. I'm so sorry about your wife. I'm sorry about your grandma. We're going to be praying for you. And, and I remember I just sat there with them until the funeral home came and they took the body out. And then Rise is coming out. I, 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 I talked to Jeff. I said, Jeff, do you mind if I pray before they take your mama out? He said, oh, that'd be great. And we, we, we got around a circle in that living room. People had the doors open. They was lined out the door, all his family, and people was crying. I began to pray, and more started crying. And, and, and I just said a brief prayer. I probably didn't pray 60 seconds, maybe, a, maybe 130 seconds at the most. And I said, amen. But you know, I... But for whatever reason, God moved me a little bit that night with compassion. And as I began to pray... I saw that I saw that husband. I saw them boys. I saw that daughter. I saw them other family members that was upset and tore up because their loved one had died. They told me that she'd made a profession of faith and they thought she was in heaven. And, and, and you know what I but I began to weep as I began to pray. And when I looked up, there wasn't nobody in that, that room and everybody standing outside that door that wasn't crying. And, and they went on and I went on and they asked me if I'd preach the funeral and you know, the next day, I, or a day or two later maybe, I preached the funeral, had the graveside the next day. And, and, and you know, they, they and I, 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 every once in a while I say, hey, you know, if you, when all this is over with, I'd love for you to come to church, you know. And, you know, they, they, that, I mean, we, we'd only been there a year. Our church really took off and grown. We'd quadrupled in about a year. We went from 8 to 32. <laughs> that sounds big when I say it the other way, don't it? Well, we quadrupled in our attendance, so we had 30 on a good Sunday, you know. But that next day, <laughs> or that next Sunday after, you know, I bet you there's 90 people in there. Man, that whole family came. I mean, I, I mean, everybody's at that trailer was in that building. And I preached. Uh, hey, uh, and they, the, the, the oldest brother, his name was J.R. It was just a few weeks later I baptized him. And, and, and when, when a big man, he brought probably about six foot four, lifted weights, big, just muscular man. Just, I mean, he, he, had, he had longer hair, had a beard. I mean, I mean, he was tough looking, with tattoos. And he, and, but by the time he he got saved that morning, got baptized. By the time he got baptized, just probably a, a week or two after that, he could hardly make his way to the baptistry. His wife had to help him to get to the baptistry. His wife had to help him to get dressed and undressed. And, 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 and some kind of injury set in on, on his spinal cord. It wasn't an injury, it was a virus that took place. Uh, and before long, he's paralyzed from the waist down. Next thing you know, from the neck down. He lived a few years after that, eventually died. He wouldn't just been a strong man to just be, you know, to not even being able to move. And he wasn't even, he's probably maybe 32 years old like you are, somewhere around your age. But, but that morning he got saved. That night, a bunch of that family come back and his wife got saved. Then his brother Charlie came and Charlie got saved. And then Charlie's wife come to the altar weeping and crying and got saved. Uh, 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 and then Jeff got right with God. The, the, uh, and then his his uh, fiance got saved. And then the daughter of that fiance got saved. Amen. And then and then uh, the 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 aunt across the street came. Uh, her name is Dottie, and got got saved. And then the the cousin across the street who had just six months before that had a little boy get run over on a bicycle and died. He come and got saved. His wife got saved. His other son came and got saved. His daughter got saved. Uh, and then old Buck and, uh, uh, and, and, and I'm forgetting his wife's name now. But, 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 but then that, that daughter got saved just as a small child. The son got saved. Hey, and just person after person, family member after family member got saved by the grace of God. And, and hey, listen, it had nothing to do with me. But hey, they saw that night that I cared for them. They saw me. They saw me tear up. They they saw that I had some empathy for them. They saw that I was moved with compassion for them. And I I, I can't remember. I counted up one time. Seemed like it was eighteen or nineteen people that got saved from that one family because of that one funeral. And I'm just saying, hey, that's what we need. And I and I, and I say we. I, I need that. Uh, hey, listen. Hey, sometimes I'm just as cold hearted as the next guy. I don't always have empathy. I don't always have sympathy. I don't always hey have the compassion that I need. And church. 
just don't have it like we should. Listen, I've said every one of us, we need a revival of empathy. We need a revival, hey, of compassion. Amen. We, yes, God help us. That morning I stood and preached, and that night I stood and preached, I imparted unto them the gospel of the grace of God. Salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death, His burial, His resurrection, praise God. I preached that unto them and I imparted that unto them. Hey, but I want you to know, hey, I did my best for that family to impart to them not just the gospel only, but impart unto them my own soul. And that's what we need. We need that empathy. I failed God so many times. There's so many times that I, that I, that I went to somebody's home and I quickly ran through a, a gospel track or ran, took my New Testament out or sit down with the Bible or maybe even up here in the altar, you know, just kind of hurriedly just went through the gospel or, uh, or even went through it thoroughly, thoroughly, but, but, but I just didn't impart my soul to it. And maybe they even got saved, but, 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 but I didn't invest into them like I should have invested. Hey, in our churches sometimes we, we will preach the gospel unto them, but we don't invest our souls unto them. But Paul invested not only the gospel only, but he invested his own soul. You look at verse 7 right here in the Bible. He said, but we were gentle among you. Gentle. You know, words mean something. They're important. I believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of the Bible. I believe that God just didn't inspire thoughts and ideas, but I believe He inspired words, thus verbal. Plain and air means all or entire. He inspired the whole Bible. Amen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. Genesis to Revelation, hallelujah. And, 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 but, but words, when we read them, we don't need to just read them and go on. We, we, we need to understand what they mean and why God put them there. And as we think about a revival of empathy, a revival of compassion, we can see here uh, in the text, in, in the verse, that, that the word, in verse 7, the word, it says the word gentle. Gentle. I've got a son, and he's 15 years old. And I, I listen, I, listen, I believe, I believe that, that men ought to be men. I believe we ought to act like men. I believe we ought to talk like men. I believe we ought to walk like men. I believe we ought to behave like men. I, I, I believe that, that not only is sodomy an abomination for God and a vile affection, but according to the Bible, I believe being effeminate is a sin. And, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of preachers that, 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 that could, need, could, have, could use a revival of manhood. And, there, and there's a lot of Christian men Hey, I'll tell you what, Brother Curly, uh, what did I call you? Caleb. Brother Caleb, I look here tonight, and I thank God for women in church. Because, I mean, I mean, I mean, let's just be honest, fellas. They get a lot of the work done. And thank God for them. But you know, I go to some churches, that's all I see. A bunch of women and kids, and, they're, and, and I'm thankful for the ladies of the church. I'm thankful for the children of the church. But I'm looking here tonight, and I see some men. Amen. And some, some men, beers don't make you masculine, but it sure helps. Amen. You get a sissy little boy, he grows a beard, it might help him a little bit. You say you, you, say you, th you, th you think that's biblical? I said, well, I don't know if it's biblical or not, but I will say this. If we wanted to have a debate about clean shaven versus beards, I, I, th I think that's a prefer pre preference. I can't even talk. A preference. Thank you, preferential. I can't see, can't talk, really can't hear either. Hey Amen. I'm lucky I heard that. But that's but 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 if, if we're going to argue about the Bible, I probably got more Bible on my side. <laughs> hey, than you got. Hey, Amen. Hey, but but what I'm saying, a man ought to be a man. But you know what? If we ain't careful, we'll raise a bunch of boys up that think being a man's, you know. Spitting in the churchyard and roughhousing, and, and I'm again. I, I, listen, I'm for spitting in the churchyard. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm for it. As long as it's white, somebody say that. Like old brother Tony said, he said he gets to heaven, find out you in the back is a sin. He's gonna be mad, amen. Or it's not a sin, that rather. Hey, 
But but I but I'm four. I'm listen. I, my son, he'll come up to me, and all he wants to do is, is fight with me. Like he he wants to come up, and, and he's been watching this kickboxer, so he wants to kickbox me. I mean, you know, and I can't even try to do what he did. Yeah, if I did, oh, I I, I don't even. <laughs> It took me a while, but I got it up here. Let's see if I can do a little bit better. Ah. He wants to come up and kick at me, punch at me, wants to wrestle around. Man, I've had I've had three heart attacks, got four stints. I can't handle that boy no more, hardly. But I but I but I'm all for that. That's what that's what them boys need. My my, my I say I say mama. It's, it's my wife, but I call her mama half the time. And, and, and all his buddies get over there. All they, they want to fight and they want to pick on one another and they want to call each other names. And Kimber said, them boys just, they're mean to one another. I said, well, that's all right. It ain't going to hurt them none. Amen. And I'm mean to my son. I'll walk in, he won't be looking. I'll push him down. <laughs> I did it when he's three years old, and I did it when he's 13 years old. And I'll make fun of him. I'll mock him. Brother Kevin helps out in this area. It's a ministry that God has given both of us. He has imparted to us this ministry. And we're doing our best to make full proof of this ministry that God has given to us. But, but you know, I'm for all that. I'm for roughhousing. I'm for a boy being a boy and a man being a man. But if we're not careful, we'll raise up a bunch of boys, hey, that don't know a thing in the world about being a gentle man. Listen, a man, a man needs to be gentle. He needs to be gentle. A man needs to be gentle to his children. Now, I was born 1969. My daddy's born 1939. I don't remember but a handful of times my daddy ever hugged my neck. I, listen, he got saved, he was a little bit more loving. He got saved, he's a little bit more loving with his words. He, you know, he, towards the end of his life, he'd say, son, I love you. But I can remember the first time he told me he loved me. I was 13 years old. He was getting ready to go into surgery. He had cancer. And he said, son, I love you. And I thought, what did he say? I mean, that was foreign to me. And I know his generation was different than my generation, raised different. But, look, but, but listen, hey, and I don't hold, listen, I don't need therapy because my daddy didn't tell me he didn't love me. You listen? I knew he loved me. I don't need a therapy because daddy didn't hug me. Are you listening? I'm fine. I'm, I probably do need therapy, but it's not because of that. Hey. But you know, I, I, I'll, I'll hug my boy just like I hug my girls. I got two girls. One's 21, one's 18. I still hug them. I still love on them. I kiss on them. And I'm going to do it because they're my baby girls. Somebody say amen right there. Just because there's a bunch of perverts in this world don't mean I can't love on my girls. Somebody say amen. Hey, and I'm going to love on my boy too. I hugged his neck to, uh, today before I left the house. He was, he was the only one at the house. I said, son, I love you. I said, I said, won't you go with us up here to Kentucky? He said, I don't know if I can handle being Brother Kevin that long. Hey, man. Hey. But, 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 but I hugged his neck, and I, and I loved him. And I want him to be gentle with his sisters. I, I want him to be a gentle man. I want him to hold the door open for ladies. I, I, I want him to be kind to people. And listen, as preachers and as ministers and ladies, this is the same to you just as well. We, we need to be gentle with people. Listen, I'm, I, hey, I'm all about preaching. Thank God for preaching. Listen, you're not going to offend me with your preaching. You can preach hard. You can preach things I don't even think is right. And, and I probably ain't going to get mad at you. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just laugh at you, make fun of you, buying you back. Hey, but, but, I, but, I'm, hey, but I'm not going to be offended by it. I'm, I'm for hard preaching. I'm for loud preaching. Hey, I'm all about it. Praise God. Hallelujah for it. Hey. But when we start dealing with individuals, we need to be some, have some gentleness. And Paul was gentle with these people. He was gentle with these converts. The word gentle means to be mild, to be tender, to be kind. Now look, at, look, look here at, at the same verse. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Now, we understand what this is. We talk about a nurse. This is a mother nursing her baby, is it not? And the Bible, say, the Bible says a nurse, as, as a nurse cherisheth her children. Cherish, cherish. That means to hold dear, to lovingly care for. These newborn babes in Christ, we need to hold them dear. We need, we need to lovingly care for them. 
Oh, we need to be gentle and we need to cherish them. And then if you, if you look at verse 8, he said, So being affectionately desirous of you. Affectionately. Affectionately. To show fondness of. To, to, to show love for. Just like the hugging. And man, I, man I, I, I'm an affectionate person. I didn't do it tonight. When I, when I first saw you back there, I didn't do it because, you know, I, I, you so tall, I didn't know where I'd end up on you. <laughs> But 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 I hadn't seen you in a while, and I wanted to hug you. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I wanted to hug you, but I, you know, he's six foot seven, man, and I just didn't know. Hey, but I, but I, we'll figure it out later, okay? Hey, <laughs> hey, but 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 Paul was affectionate. I mean, he was the fa- he was so affectionate. He he compared it to hey, like a mother that that would nurse their child. And that's how we're to be in the ministry. We're, we're to cherish them. We're, we're to be a, a affectionate unto them. And the boy, let's just, let's just keep reading here in, in the Bible. You drop down. It says, uh, it says, but also our souls, because you, it's somebody important, not the gospel only, but our soul, own souls, because you were dear to us. That's why we impart our own souls, because you were dear to us. That means greatly loved or valued. It means beloved or precious. Amen? Oh, yes, dear. And, and you know, these words that, 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 I, that I, I've tried to point out to you here uh, in these verses here, I mean, I mean we, we, we look at these words, we think of these words, and when we think about the mother with the child, and we think about being a gentleman, and we think about hugging our kids and hugging our spouse, we, we, think, about, uh, we think about it in context of family. Paul even uses it there in context of family to some degree, and we think about, about, about that. Hey, but really the context of, of the entire Scripture is not our family, not our spouse, not our children, but, but, but these words are in context of those that we minister to. That, let's hear that again. These words are in context of those that we minister to. Not just the pastor. Not just the pastor's wife. Hey, not, not just the, the deacon or, or the Sunday school teacher, but every one of us as believers, as Christians, we are a servant to God. We are a minister for God. And we're to minister to people. Hey, and we're to, we're to have these characteristics when we minister unto these individuals. God help us. That's the context that we find here in the Word of God. These words are in context of those of whom we minister to. Now sadly, am I preaching too long? Sadly, we won't insulate ourselves. How long have you been pastor, Book Adam? Eight years. Here with just one church. What about that? Most, most people don't make it 18 months at one church. He's made it eight years. That's something right there. Eight years is a long time. I bet you, I don't know, he, he, he's never, you know, really communicated any of this to me. But I bet you, because I, I know people and I know ministry and I know Baptists and I know churches, I bet you there's been a few people that have come through here that has hurt him, wounded him. Are you listening? I bet you that's true of his wife too. And I bet you, if you've been in church for eight years yourself, you don't have to pastor to get hurt. You don't have to pastor a church or be a pastor's wife, hey, to be injured or to be wounded in church. I go, I go on visitation sometimes, and, and people say, well, I used to go to church, but I got hurt. If I've heard that, I've heard that a thousand times. Uh, probably 3,000 times. Well, I used to go to church, but I got hurt. Well, join the club. I've got hurt too. I've been pastoring for 29 years. You don't think, hey, people have hurt me? And see, what happens when we get hurt, and I'm talking about me, I'm talking about Brother Caleb, I'm talking about you, I'm talking, I'm talking about everybody. When we get hurt, we'll, we'll, we'll insulate ourselves. We'll, we'll begin to put guards up, walls up, and, and we'll think to ourselves, well, I ain't going to get that close to somebody again. I'm not, hey, I'm not going to invest in them. They're just going to turn around and hurt me just like everybody else has. There's a lot of preachers today that God has taken their hand. He has taken His hand off of them because they've had that attitude. 
They, they, and and listen, I, listen, I understand. I empathize with them. I, hey, I empathize with the preacher's wife. I empathize with the church member that gets hurt. Listen, I know how it is. You know how it is. And if, but if we're not careful, we, we, we will insulate ourselves. We will put our, our guard up. We'll build walls. And, and we'll no longer have sympathy for people. We'll no longer empathize with people. We'll no longer have compassion with people because we're trying to protect our own selves. But that's not the will of God. You don't think the Apostle Paul was hurt? Listen, hey, Paul was stripped of every piece of clothing he had on his body. Thrown in jail. They stoned him and left him for dead. They striped him. I mean, laid a whip to his back, a cat of nine tails, just like they did our Lord Jesus. Amen. Shipwrecked. I mean, I mean, if anybody ever saw, he had that thorn in the flesh, we don't know what it was, but he was there. He was so bad that he asked God three times, hey, Lord, please take this thorn away from me. And God said, no. I'm leaving that thorn with you. My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. He suffered. But here he is. Here he is being compassionate. Here he is being empathetic. Here he is. He's, he's uh, being gentle. He's cherishing these people. He's, he's being affectionate unto, unto these people. They're dear to him, uh, the Bible says. And listen, it, 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 we, listen, we want to be nice to folks on Sunday morning, but we don't want to be bothered by them through the week. Ah. Preachers the same way. Sometimes preachers are worse. Oh, yeah, somebody come in. God bless you, brother. We're so glad you're here. Sister, God bless you. I'm praying for your mom and them. God bless you. Oh, yeah, I, I, well, listen, we, we thought about you the other day. God bless you. We're glad you come today. Boy, you, you, boy, ain't that a nice young man come to church with us this morning? Thank God. Listen, we're praying for your family. We'll send you a flower arrangement. But just wait till they call on Monday morning or on Tuesday night or Wednesday night or when you got a good hunting trip going. Woo. Hey, man. Oh, yeah. Or right in the middle of a Tennessee football game. What's wrong with them people? I mean, they know, they know it's game day. My church, we don't plan activities on game day. My, the, the, the ladies, the girls in our church, they, they, they have June weddings. They know better than to schedule it on, on game day. Because the preacher ain't coming if the wedding's on game day. Listen, I don't care if it's my own daughter. And my own daughters, they've been raised better in that mess. <laughs> hey, man, they know not to Hey, they know. Hey, if you want to have a fall wedding, you look for the open date. <laughs> hey, man, you got to go and do that. That's kind of that mess on the bye week. Hey, man. But what do you know? I mean, 3.30 comes and, hey, and the, and the music coming on on CBS. Hey, and I'm getting ready to sit down. And there it goes. Preacher, I need to talk for you just a minute. It's game day. Hey, man. I've started leaving a message. Hello. This is Pastor Tom Hatley. I will be available in four hours unless there's over overtime. Yeah. please call the assistant pastor at 865 <laughs> then he quit on me what am I going to do now hey amen please call the song leader brother Kevin will be available during these hours which I know better than that hey amen but I mean we'll, we'll be nice to folks on Sunday morning hey and Sunday night maybe but we don't want to be bothered by, by them through the week because we don't have no compassion. We don't have no sympathy. We don't have no empathy. That's why we need a, a revival of, of empathy. Listen, I, you know who I think are the best empathizers? New converts. Hey, man. I mean, I mean listen, hey. They, they, because it wasn't that long ago that, 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 that they was in the same boat. Hey, man. Boy, I'll tell you what, sister. Who's the sister that testified about all, it was that, who, whose wife was that? 
Brother Zach's wife, where'd they go? They, they leave. Baby, now outside smoking. <laughs> hey, she, <laughs> I, I can't get over it. Yeah, that, 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 that was worth the drive to Kentucky to hear somebody say, well, all, all I wanted was to be saved from hell, but I got so much more. Oh, listen, that was worth the drive. Hey, man, right there just to hear that. Hey, man. And you, new converts, hey, they've not forgotten about it. But some of us old heads, we have. And we no longer empathize. We no longer have compassion. Listen, people's lives are messy. But we can't be afraid to get our hands dirty. Amen. We're ministers. We're servants. Never lose the ability to feel someone else's hurt. Never lose that ability. Preachers, never lose that ability. Church members, never lose the ability to feel someone else's hurt. God help us. We need to empathize with folks, with their sorrows, with their struggles, with their sufferings. We must willing to be willing to invest in people. We must be willing to invest in others. And we must be willing to invest in one another. You know, the Bible says we're to weep with those that weep. And we're to rejoice with those that rejoice. Amen. We're to, we're to, to, to bear one another's burdens. Listen, the Scripture says it better than I ever could. Hey, we must be willing to impart not just the gospel of God only, but our own souls. We need, God help us, a revival of empathy, a revival of compassion. Brother Caleb, you come. Well, I tell you, <clears throat> we didn't care about people. In every facet of our church, it's about people. Sunday school teachers, you need to start thinking about your students. Yeah. Think about the nursing home. Home. Those residents are people. And they hurt. And they suffer. Our youth ministry, youth department. When you think about those children, you say, Brother Caleb, I've been hurt investing in people. If so have I. I got to thinking about some, like when Brother Tom was preaching there, I got to thinking about some that I have invested a lot in. Not just tried to invest my soul, but financially, I've tried to invest in their family.